lecture 22. Transponders up. Okay, the first question. Human brain is derived embryologically from five vesicles. The third of this of these secondary vesicles, the mesencephalon, gives rise to what? If you got it right, it is the midbrain. Uh, midbrain is derived from the mesencephalon. Okay, question two. Which of the following statements regarding spinal nerves is not correct? All these are correct except for one. scattered. Um, there are both motor and sensory fibers in many of the spinal nerves. We'll go through them and talk about them in a little bit more detail in other sections. Uh, all fibers are directly covered by an endoneurium and they are divided up into fascicles. So the only one not correct is there's both dendrites and uh, axons within the fibers. Sensory uh, and motor. Okay, number Okay, what I was looking for was letter A, and most of you got it. Vestibular cochlear reflexes, uh, the, uh, some of the ocular reflexes that have positioned themselves with respect to the vestibular apparatus, like nystagmus is a class of vestibular ocular. But A is correct. When you trip and put your arms out to catch yourself, that's the vestibular placing reaction. Number four, which of the following is monosynaptic? Very classic question on 
board exams and other places, which is monosynaptic. Okay, five seconds. And uh, I was looking for letter C, which is true. That's the tendon reflex, also called the pillar tendon test reflex at the monosynaptic. The withdrawal reflex, you might think, is very rapid and, and is uh, monosynaptic, does require interneurons and all kinds of interaction with other central processing. Number five. Five seconds. Okay. B is the correct answer. There's a lot of GI reflexes that have these types of uh, uh, contractual names, if you will. Gastro refers to the receptor and and colic the effector. So stretch of the stomach causes an increase in colonic motility, moves food along the conveyor belt, if you will. Talk about these second semester, but it's a visceral, visceral reflex. Okay, so that gets us to today's material, which is uh, we got through the brain stem and now we're moving into the midbrain. So we talked about the medulla down here in the pons. The midbrain is this area just uh, more uh, anterior cephalic from the palm, so it's in these brackets here. So what they classically say, it's a brainstem between the pons and the diencephalon. Most uh, texts do say it's part of the brainstem, although I've heard other uh, opinions too. Uh, one of the prominent structures in the midbrain is on the uh, superficial or the surface, superior surface, I guess you could say. And so this is it right here in cross section. This is looking down on these four little swollen areas, and they're called the corpora quadrigemina, which means four bodies. And they're literally four little globular structures on the surface just beneath the cerebellum. And the two superior colliculi uh, are functioning for visceral, or excuse me, visual reflexes when you, some of those eye pointing reflexes and so forth we talked about. And the inferior colliculi are functioning for auditory reflexes, the uh, uh, realization of position of sound in respect to you and other things we use our ears for as far as reflexive. So uh, those are the corpora quadrigemina. Before I get to the rest of the membrane, I have to take it aside. I mentioned nuclei off and on, but I haven't defined it. They're literally dark internal structures within the central nervous system. Uh, they're not red and blue. This is just an artist's depiction. But inside the cerebrum, there's some areas in various shapes that stain a lot darker than the rest of the material, and that's because they have 
a high density of cell bodies in these areas. This shows you some of the very significant nuclei, such as the globus pallidus and the putamen and the thalamus and so forth. So we're going to talk about these nuclei off and on, but uh, before we do, I just want to get back to midbrain and talk about two nuclei in the midbrain area. So let's first orient you. So here's those uh, corpora quadrigemina we just talked about. And if you cut, cut or have a section through the superior colliculi, uh, you'll see this is superior colliculi here. And so remember, it's right underneath the cerebellum. So this would be the uh, superior side, if you will. Uh, halfway through there, you'd see a, a reddish structure, two reddish globular structures called red nuclei. The red appears to be because they have a high rate of blood flow. And just above them in the figure is a substantia niagara, is some dark staining tissue that they refer to as another uh, midbrain nuclei. These two nuclei are part of our motor tone control, they help control posture and coordination as far as our motor system. And they're kind of interesting, located between the cerebellum and the motor cortex, but those are uh, posture or coordination nuclei, they usually say. Now we're going to move on past the midbrain up to the diencephalon, which is part of the forebrain. So we're right up here in this area. So the midbrain, you see in brackets right above there, more superior, is the diencephalon. Di means two, as you all know, and cephalon uh, refers to cephalic structures. So it's referring to two principal parts of the structure, the thalamus and hypothalamus, as the di uh, portion. Uh, it's right in the middle of the cerebrum. I, this is, of course, a sagittal section, so it's completely surrounded by the cerebrum. You can see if you cut right through here, you'd run into it. So it's right centered in the cerebrum. And they're uh, dark, staining both the parts of the... Uh, diencephalon, could, you know, some of them are mini nuclei, but they're definitely dark standing and have dark staining and they have lots of, of uh, nuclei making up their structure. The thalamus is two egg-shaped large nuclei on each side of the third ventricle. So here's the third ventricle, here's a lateral ventricle. So right here on each side of the third ventricle is these large egg-shaped uh, uh, nuclei, and we call them the thalamus, we've mentioned them before. Uh, they're joined actually by a commissure, which is a picture too well, I'll show you some figures in a minute, which are, which is called the intermediate mass because of its position. So they are interconnected by commissure tracks, just like we talked about the great commissure and the corpus callosum. Below the, the thalamus is uh, something cleverly called the hypothalamus, and it's made up of many nuclei, scattered nuclei just inferior to the thalamus. Uh, and so we'll talk about function of these two structures. First of all, the thalamus, don't worry about these little portions. This is uh, Martini's view, and, and they differ tremendously from uh, author to author. But remember, the thalamus is the relay th station for sensory traffic. So as we said when we're talking about order of nuclei, first, second order, and so forth, nuclei, almost all the sensory tracts, except maybe the spinal cerebellar tract, uh, has a nuclei in this um, thalamus. So it's a relay center between the peripheral uh, sensors, sensory system, and the sensory cortex, um, and, and covering both spinal sensory traffic or spinal afferents as well as cephalic. Uh, perhaps the only cephalic sense that doesn't synapse in the thalamus is the olfactory sense. So it relays information from all these different uh, sensory devices up to the cerebral area, which is the processing area. Some people say there's some sensory interpretation there. Uh, it's a matter of conjecture. I think most of that would be the interpretation of where to send, send the information forward. Uh, I don't think there's a lot of sensory interpretation at all in this nuclei. 
the hypothalamus is the regulatory center for the autonomic nervous system. So here's the thalamus up here. Just below there is the hypothalamus. And uh, it's kind of classic. Almost every figure you see of the hypothalamus looks like some jelly beans. And that's what this does. It's like a cluster of nuclei called preoptic, ventricular, and super, superoptic. There's all of these nuclei, each having a critical function as far as the autonomic nervous system. Um, the main thing they're doing is regulating what we call homeostasis or our internal environment. And uh, in second semester when we talk about the endocrine system, we have a lecture on the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland. One principal role of the hypothalamus is to uh, produce trophic factors that control pituitary gland secretion. Also, there's nerve tracts coming down from some of these nuclei into the posterior lobe of the pituitary gland. So there's an intimate association between the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland uh, regulating high, uh, homeostasis and many of our vegetative activities such as uh, cardiovascular system as far as blood pressure and regulation of, of the tone, fluid, electrolyte balance, temperature, satiety, sleep, endocrine functions, all, of, all kinds of things are regulated through that axis. And we're going to, there's no reason to try and go through it twice, so we're going to save that whole long and interesting story to the uh, second semester, the end of the second semester, actually. And as I said, just below the hypothalamus right here, in a special little pocket, so it's hercicalized the uh, pituitary gland, which is really part of the nervous system, especially the neural hypothesis. It's divided into two lobes. One's called the anterior pituitary, or more properly, the adenohypothesis, and the posterior pituitary is called favorably the neural hypothesis. So those are really different structures histologically and, and functionally. Uh, and like I said, we'll talk about the eight or 10, depending on how you call it, hormones that come out of those uh, parts of our system and what they all do and how they control the second semester. There's another gland in the brain that's right here, the, just uh, inferior to the posterior end of the corpus callosum. So here's the corpus callosum right here, and right here is the pineal gland. It's a small globular mass, and its function is Again, endocrine can produce a hormone melatonin, and we now, um, it's a protein in nature, and we now think it plays a big role in our diurnal rhythm, regulating 24 hour rhythms that uh, play a role in much of our life, such as uh, sleep wake cycle and, and uh, release of cortisol and so forth. And we'll talk about that also a little bit more in the second semester melatonin. The largest part of the brain, of course, is the cerebrum, and there's, we talked about the two hemispheres, but there's a left and right half to the cerebrum, and they're quite large, they're three to four times the size of the cerebellum. And the surface, as you've seen in, all the way through your life in various depictions, has what we call convolutions. Uh, the convolutions are called gyri, and the grooves are called sulci. Gyres, of course, plural for gyrus, and sulci for sulcus. So there are grooves here, which we call sulcus, and swollen areas, which we call gyrus. Uh, some of these play a role in markers for parts of the brain, as we'll talk about in just a second. Probably the best place to start talking about the cerebrum is the major parts, subdivisions of the cerebrum, and it's named after the cranial bones that overlie that particular part of the cerebrum. So as you would expect, we call this part right here the frontal lobe lying under each frontal bone. The parietal lobe lies underneath the parietal bone, as you see in yellow. Uh, the occipital lobe in the posterior part of the brain beneath the occipital bone temporal lobe, much larger, is depicted there. And there's, in the human, a small islet, they say, of a cerebrum that's just between the temporal and the frontal bone if you pull apart the tissue, and that's called the insula. Uh, 
there are some landmarks that help us to talk about structures and function within the cerebrum. And I've already mentioned aside some of these, even though I never defined them. So the longitudinal cerebral fissure is what divides the two hemispheres. So it goes the whole length of the, that's when we cut the brain sagittally, that's where we cut it. So right through between the left and right hemisphere. The central sulcus is right behind the frontal lobe between that and the parietal lobe, and uh, it's depicted uh, here. And when we talk about the prefrontal, or the frontal gyrus and the parietal gyrus, or the whatever they, you want to call that, the precentral gyrus, well, that's where the, the motor cortex and the sensory cortex is. We'll talk about that in a second. Then there's a lateral sulcus that divides the temporal lobe from the frontal on the parietal lobe, and that's right here, so that's called the lateral sulcus. The cerebral cortex itself is, is very thin. We kind of think it's such a huge deal. It is, uh, physiologically or functionally, but it, it's a very small structure. Two to five millimeters, that's 20% of a centimeter. It's very, very small. And it's... Uh, composed of cell bodies in the nervous system. They estimate that 75% of all the cell bodies in the nervous system are in that cerebral cortex. So it's layered uh, and had in all these silky and gyri, so that increases the surface area, but very, very thin structure. Beneath that is the white matter. So the white matter is almost the majority of the cerebrum. I don't know what percent, but overall tremendous majority. And that's where all kinds of myelinated nerve fibers is going to and from the cerebral cortex. I mentioned off and on, now I can finally define it, the corpus callosum. So it's a C-shaped structure. That's the only connection between the cerebral hemispheres. And we're going to talk about it a lot in the next lecture. Let me talk about what happens when it's uh, cut. But the, this contains the decussating tracts, the tracts that move from one hemisphere to the other. So it's called the corpus callosum, and that's where the tracts go back and forth. By the way, here's that intermediate commissure or intermediate masses that between that has the decussating tracts between the thalamus. So here's the thalamus and the intermediate mass just inferior to the corpus callosum. Right in here, just below the corpus callosum, on each side is the lateral ventricles, and there's a little membrane that separates one lateral ventricle from the other, and that's called the septum pellucidum. It simply means clear membrane, but it just uh, separates the two lateral ventricles. And if you do, a, or maybe you've already done dissection of the cat brain, you'll cut through that. Intermediate mass, I already mentioned. The fornix is this little wing of tissue that lies just beneath the corpus callosum and superior, immediately superior to the thalamus. The fornix extends from the uh, hippocampus, which is down here on the other side. You can't see on the other side, the brain's have coming up from the, um, the temporal lobe, and then it goes up here to the hypothalamus. So it extends from the hippocampus to the hypothalamus, containing tracts, nerve tracts from those connecting those two areas. We're going to show you some figures that tie together the structures in just a minute. Actually, right now. So there are two, I always call these things ethereal concepts, and many actually in the brain, but there are two that we always present in this level of nervous anatomy and function. The limbic system is one of those two, and they call it ethereal because it's really hard to define, and every book has different structures that are incorporated in it and different functions. But uh, I think Martini has one of the clearest and um, perhaps universally acceptable uh, structures and functions. So it's a nice way to present the limbic system. So this is right out of his book. The hippocampus I mentioned before is the kind of the middle of sagittal area of the, the uh, 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 low, the temporal lobe right here in red. And it curves around and goes up towards the 
a corpus callosum. So that's called the hippocampus, and it's nerve tracts primarily. And the cingulate gyrus, also dense array of tracts, is right above the corpus callosum. So it's a set of tracts above the corpus callosum. The fornix I already mentioned, it's right here, it comes up from the hippocampus, it goes towards the, um, the, all the nuclei in the hypothalamus. Nice figure here showing the hypothalamus right here at the end of the fornix. And then the hypothalamus is in this area, and there's, uh, they put et cetera because some people put other structures like the amygdala as part of it, but those are the principal structures. They're kind of an overall ring of structures that are in the inner border of the cerebrum, just there above and below the corpus callosum. And the limbic system has classically been our center of our emotions. It sort of reminds me of the, the um, early Renaissance authors of describing the heart as our soul or whatever. But anyway, it's, it's our emotional response center and disruptions to its structure often lead to um, bizarre behaviors. It's also where long-term memory is housed and people with hippocampal defects definitely have memory defects. That's been shown well. And We'll talk about a little bit more uh, functionally at the next lecture. We talk about some general topics as memory and so forth. So we'll get into this more. But about all we ever rely, the limbic system too universally is emotions and memory. The other strange thing that's very difficult to talk about is a reticular activating system. And the, there's no structures, specific structures. and usually a lot, and they say a network of dark staining masses, of nuclei, that are between the brain stem and the cerebrum. <laughs> and what it's doing is regulating the sensory and motor traffic between the spinal cord and the brain. It's, it's how we regulate how conscious we are of our surroundings. So it's, uh, it's called the reticular activating system, and it's like a filter between our periphery and our uh, cortex, our consciousness. We have the capacity while we're asleep to, to turn off essentially uh, all of our sensory systems. So we're getting very little input from our visual cortex, from our visual system, from our auditory system, from our uh, touch receptors and so forth, and kind of go into this unconscious state where we can rest. And, that's like upregulating the reticular activating system. That's what they say. So this is the system that regulates how much information comes in periphery to the central nervous system. The same when you're concentrating on any subject, when you're studying, when you're focusing your attention on on a show or a movie, you shut off touch receptors. You know, you're not conscious. You're sitting down. You're not conscious of other things like lights and so forth in the background, you're focusing all your attention to uh, cortical behavior, well, that's activating this reticular activating system. So it adjusts how alert we are to peripheral sensory, stim sensory stimulation. And uh, other than that, <laughs> it's uh, very ethereal. Nobody tries to put much uh, definitive structure to this function. Okay, we can say some better, more uh, specific things about what's going on in different parts of the cerebrum. Do a number of interesting studies. Uh, when I first started working in, used to teach at your own medical school, one of the anatomists once had me come to the anatomy library and wanted to show me this particular brain that had come in from this uh, cadaver. And the brain was filled, it looked like uh, Swiss cheese. It was filled with little um, uh, P-shaped uh, vacuoles or spaces, and some of them were much larger than that. Some of them were almost ping pong ball shapes, and I, I was amazed. And he said that um, almost all the brains that come in have these spaces or evacuated areas in them, and especially the senior citizens. And it was from these type of lesions, they're called, uh, that we started learning something about how people lost. Uh, Function. If you have a relative that has a stroke, usually what happens is they've lost blood flow to a part of their uh, 
cerebrum, it's a cerebral stroke. And what happens is that part is often lost and becomes this little empty area in your brain. And the patient may lose a part of their behavior or abilities, uh, or it may recover by being recruited in another area. But uh, from those looking at patients and their behaviors and, and looking at their brains at, during pathology studies, they started relating what uh, activity or what abilities were lost with specific strokes. And from that, um, gained some information about function, structure versus function. Uh, some of these were transient ischemic events where uh, recovery occurred. Sometimes, as we'll talk about, we can relate the loci of these fairly well by MRI. So by relating uh, some uh, disease to loss in function, we gradually gained more and more information about what was going on in, in the brain. Now, more specifically, we've learned a lot about how often functions are related to each other in uh, columns. They call them cortical columns. So a lot of our responses are organized in the cortex in columns. And finally, when these areas are really active, there's often changes in blood flow or metabolism that we can now uh, mod uh, moderate or watch by various uh, systems. And just to give you uh, some idea how we, moder how we uh, monitor uh, blood flow and metabolism, we have all kinds of different imaging effects that we can use in living individuals or in patients. Uh, PET, or positron emission tomography, uh, is a method of, of uh, monitoring or, or uh, detecting gamma rays which are being emitted from uh, some tracer, some positron emitting tracer. So we can use a tracer tag to say glucose and then have a patient look at a bright object that he's not used to staring at, and you'll see what area of the brain becomes increasingly lit up uh, as if the metabolic activity is very much increased. As So when the optical uh, activity is elevated, then this occipital uh, lobe lights up. So much has been learned by looking at changes in blood flow and metabolism during patients' activity changes. MRI, magnificent, uh, magnetic resident imaging, uh, uses nuclear magnetic resonance, what we can do is uh, subject a structure to uh, a magnetic resonance at a certain frequency, and nuclei both reflect and absorb that resonance and emit uh, a slightly different magnetic image. And we can, even on a two-dimensional landscape, look at tissue, uh, different tissues release uh, magnetic resonance at different frequencies. So you can very easily discriminate, discriminate different tissue densities, uh, and the brain is a great uh, mechanism for imaging the brain, MRI, and see very well the different structures in the brain on a two-dimensional basis. And finally, optical imaging and spectroscopy is newer techniques using uh, a very, uh, just they call it a, a uh, near infrared emitter, uh, emitter for near infrared light very close to the skull, uh, activates and that infrared light is absorbed and reflected at different, by different tissues, uh, different uh, mechanisms, and then they have a, um, a optical fiber bundle that can pick up that infrared light and uh, figure out which part of the brain is absorbing and reflecting that uh, uh, light and evidently it's very sensitive to blood flow and oxygenation and it works very well in the frontal lobe so they've used that to figure out what's going on in the frontal lobe during different activities. So anyway, we've used these different imaging techniques to learn quite a bit about what's going on in the brain in different parts of the brain during different activities. And from that we've come up with some of the things that we're going to talk, talk about in the next two lectures. So just going through the story of what's known very basically now, uh, the, we're going to first talk about sensory areas and then motor areas. And 
you talk about primary areas as those areas that are directly coupled to the sensory receptor. Uh, so there are, first of all, the primary somatosensory area we've already talked about is in the postcentral gyrus. So here's the central sulcus right here. The gyrus just posterior to that is where we get primary somatosensory information. So this is directly connected through the thalamus and so forth to uh, the sensory receptors on the surface for pain, temperature, touch, and so forth. And a sense of, of our whole somato system is kind of reflected. And as you remember, that's in a somatotropic organization. So this is that gyrus, and it's as if we had little man of homunculus lying on that uh, structure. We talked about how it's not evenly uh, distributed as far as the, the surface area of the actual uh, structure. So a tremendous amount of that surface is devoted to the face and a large amount to the hands and much less. And again, that, the significance of that is uh, how much uh, dexterity and how much fine uh, uh, texture we can get uh, from those uh, receptors. Uh, the primary visual area is in the occipital lobe, so the optic nerve goes right to there. So the retina is directly connected uh, to this cortex, and that's where we perceive the structures which we're visualizing. The primary auditory uh, area directly coupled to the cochlear device is just below the lateral sulcus, so uh, right here in the superior part of the temporal lobe. The primary olfactory cortex is just anterior to the auditory cortex, so this is directly uh, connected to that olfactory epithelium in the nasal sinus that we talked about, so that's where we sense uh, smell or odor. And then some primary motor areas. Uh, the primary motor cortex is just anterior to the central sulcus, and its neurons supply that cortical spinal tract that we talked about when we we're talking about the spinal cord. So they would supply the upper motor neuron. And it's also organized somatotropic. So that figure was there, like right here. And so the motor cortex is organized just like the sensory cortex, where you have an un unequal distribution depending on the size of motor units and so forth, much more area to. Uh, places where we need small motor units. Uh, language areas are really interesting and we've learned quite a bit about them and we'll talk about some of this in the next lecture, but um, there's a language area called uh, Warnicke's area that translates, thought, translates thoughts into writing or speech. So it takes what we're thinking about and converts it into the symbols which we realize is, uh, stands for that, either speaking or writing. Uh, and it's a motor area where it's forming our words, and so we call it Broca's area. And it's just anterior to the motor cortex right here in light blue. So that's so the motor cortex is right here, so that's called Broca's area. And so we can't form words or come out with logical writing without this area. And there's people with Broca's aphasia, Broca's deficit, that lack function in this area. And so they can't put their, it's very frustrating because they can't put their thoughts into words or into written context. It's very, they have a very uh, reduced vocabulary. Uh, they get so frustrated they often curse and, uh, uh, because of the inability to correspond, they usually end up with reduced understanding of language. And it's definitely related to uh, problems of this part of our cortex, Broca's aphasia. Okay, so the primary areas either uh, receive direct information to, from the sensory receptors, uh, or in the case of the primary motor, uh, areas uh, send out upper motor neurons to regulate motor activity. Uh, the association areas are located near each of the primary sensory areas, and they are the secondary area which gets the information. So 
the, the visual cortex would receive the um, message from the retina, but it would be useless without the ability to interpret that based on past visual experiences and and uh, put it into our library on is this this face or that face, is it this kind of tree or that bush, and make some sense of it. So the uh, these association areas release kind of re uh, compare what we're currently sensing to our past experience. Uh, so there's a somatosensory association area, which is right here, just posterior to our somatosensory cortex. And it, it takes all types of uh, pain and, and pressure or touch. It takes all that um, uh, information and integrates it into uh, some sense. If it's, we may not be that we need to respond, it may be just putting it into what's going on in our current uh, environment to decide whether there needs to be a response. But it integrates temperature and all these different senses and puts them together and decides whether there needs to be some response. So that's the somato sensory association area. It's also called the spatial association area. The visual association area is what I just referred to a second ago. That has to integrate what we're seeing with the past uh, information that we've seen before. And so the, the visual, the primary visual cortex is right here. The association area is right in front of that. It's just a slightly um, uh, anterior to the visual cortex. And it relates what we're seeing again to what we've seen in the past and make some, we can make judgments based on that. There's also an auditory association area, quite large, called Wernicke's area. That's just inferior to our primary auditory area. And when people speak and you read things even, you have to change those symbols into what they mean, and that's the role of Wernicke's uh, area. So it converts words into thought, into understanding. Uh, I had a student in medical school years ago that had a Wernicke's deficit. This kind of an interesting, funny story in a way, but this, uh, in many medical schools, students come in other than the normal route, you all know this. Uh, and in this case, this was a relative of a very important legislator, and his family had lots of money, so somehow he got into medical school. He wasn't really of the correct ability academically, but he got in. So we always have, some people call them cookies, but anyway, we always have a couple of students in medical school that were there. They got in by some interesting way. Well, I was charged as one of the younger faculty to get this guy through medical school, and I failed. But anyway, he was in my class, and he, he couldn't pass any of my tests, and so I met with him a tremendous number of hours. And I go through a particular concept with him, both with words and writing it out, and then I'd ask him to respond. And I'd say, you understand? Yes, and we'll, we'll repeat it back. And these flowery, beautiful words came out that meant absolutely nothing. And the word, the term word salad is correct. They have often these very beautiful vocabularies with words you, you know, amazed at, but they have no logic in how they're organized. And this is just an example of what a talk from a Wernicke's uh, aphasia person is. But they put all these words together, and if you try to figure out what the words mean, it's meaningless. And it was very frustrating working with this young man. He, uh, I don't know whatever happened to him, but he didn't make it through medical school. So this is often the case. They have a very difficult time functioning. Okay, Wernicke's deficit. There's another area, I couldn't find a, uh, anything other than a very old figure of it, called the general interpretive area or Gnostic area that integrates all different sensory associative areas. And so if we have visual information and some amount of sensory information, auditory information, it puts all these together and figures out some response. It's just called the Gnostic center. It's kind of in the middle of the parietal lobe. There's a very interesting 
center that's just in front of the motor cortex called the premolar area. Most of our activities are like computers, uh, have been hooked together in little tiny uh, motor responses, that are hooked, but hooked together into a complex uh, uh, set of commands, so even turning a page or feeding yourself. All these are programmed responses, and that's the responsibility of the premotor area. So in the motor cortex, you have specific uh, nerves that each cause a certain muscle to move. Well, so that that's all coordinated, the pre-motor area has pattern responses programmed into it uh, so that, you know, you can tell it the motor cortex to move a page. So it's just like a computer would program a series of steps. This is what the pre-motor area does. Probably the most complex example of this would be teaching a child to play the piano and the scales and all those. Those are uh, those scale-type programs in that premotor area where they've trained over and over the student to move his finger in such a way to play chords and so forth. All of that is stored in this premotor or primary motor cortex and controls learned motor activity. There's uh, eye scanning movements that are quite complex and there's a frontal eye field area that is a frontal cortex that controls complex eye movements and scanning, looking for structures and so forth. So that's the major things I wanted to talk about. And, and uh, next time we'll start from here. I have the uh, uh, the uh, cerebral uh, nerves, the, uh, the cranial nerves. We'll talk about next time in their function, and then some more stuff on uh, cerebral function.